So, we understood the algorithm, it is equally important for us to understand the specimens for diagnosis. Why is it important? In an adult, it is easy to come by because they can voluntarily give you sputum, children cannot. One, they may not produce symptom, uh, sputum at all. Two, even if they do produce sputum, they are not able to expectorate at will. And young children cannot even be told to expectorate or throw up sputum out, they tend to swallow it. And that makes the specimen learning about specimen in childhood TB uh, more important. So, as I said, you could have a spontaneously cuffed up sputum, which is good to come by in an older child, say above 7, 8, or 9 years of age, or you could have a child at any age who is just having dry cough, you could induce the sputum and we will learn about it how we do it, or you could have a situation where the child is just not bringing up that sputum and you could use alternatively gastric aspirate. I will explain to you why gastric aspirate is important. And rarely, like I said, for persistent pneumonias where you refer this child to an expert, you may have <coughs> to recourse to bronchoscopic lavage. This is not what we use routinely. For sputum, you need two specimen if it is for smear and if it is CB naught, a single specimen is needed. Generally, children up to 8 to 10 years can bring up sputum. What is gastric aspirate? Gastric aspirate is a technique which is used to collect gastric contents to confirm TB diagnosis as children often are unable to expect it sputum and they tend to swallow it. Once they swallowed it, that swallowed sputum which may contain MTB can be retrieved from the stomach content because it stays there for a while. But it will stay there if only this child remains fasting. That means a gastric aspiration is always performed after some period of fasting which we say is about 4 hours to 6 hours in an older child and you in, a, in an infant perhaps you will not be able to keep them fasting longer than 3 hours. And it, ha, it is performed on two consecutive markings if you are looking at smear and a single if you have CB not available. Induced sputum is an alternative therapy which is alternative method of collecting uh, 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 specimen which is there. Sputum production can often be induced by giving 3 to 5 percent hypertonic saline. So, you nebulize 3 to 5 percent hypertonic saline and child expectorates that sputum thereafter once it is induced. Since hypertonic saline sometimes can cause V's, it is important that we premedicate this child with nebulized salbutamol. So, you first give a course of salbutamol followed by 3 to 5 percent hypertonic saline. So, you give one dose and thereafter you give 3 to 5 percent hypertonic saline to the patient. This older child after inducing sputum may be able to provide this specimen at uh, you know by, by you, you give light percussion after inducing sputum and ask the child to expect it and they are able to throw up. But in a younger child who does not understand these instructions, this way will be again swallowed. And what you can do is in that situation, we can attach a mucus trap to wall suction and put that through the nose into the nasopharynx. When it tickles the nasopharynx, the child it will provoke cough and that induced sputum which has been loosened by percussion by you, chest percussion would come up and because of the suction, it will be trapped into the mucus trap before the child is able to swallow it and that is a nasopharyngeal collection of the deep respiratory sputum which has been induced by giving hypertonic saline and that is why it is called induced sputum. So, these are important ways we can, we can collect uh, the sputums. What is important uh, to remember is sputum induction is an aerosol generating procedure in a potentially infected child. And therefore, for the safety of the health worker, it is important that adequate infection control precautions are ensured. Some the, the, there should be uh, a negative pressure, there, uh, there should be uh, an N95 mask which is used so that the, uh, the, there is enough safety for the health worker in there. What is also important is that if this child is having severe respiratory distress or has a low level of consciousness or has is intubated or is bleeding or has current wheezing, then inducing sputum may not be a good idea because their, their distress may increase. So, with these caveats, it is possible to use induced sputum in younger children who are not able to expectorate or give you sputum directly. Now, once you have collected the sputum, the other 
difficulty we always had in children was that because it's a possible acillary disease, it's a primary disease, the smear positivity was very poor. Smear positivity range about 10 to 15 percent in, in pediatric TB with, in younger children. In older adolescent, it may be about 40 percent. So as a thumb rule, the, whenever you have a possible acillary disease, the, the yield is less. But this is increased tremendously by use of CB0. And these are many studies which have shown that a CB net can pick almost as two third or as much as a culture from, from respiratory specimen and there are enough to do that. But having said that, it is very important to tell here at this point of time, the culture positivity in pediatric TB is not more than 50 percent. So understand this very clearly, overall yield in the respiratory specimen is less than culture or equal to culture with gene expert, but which is about 50 percent overall, which means a negative CB0 does not rule out TB. So, it is a good rule in test, but it is not a very good rule out test. That is something important to remember because our, our uh, you know, uh, looking up for, for a test which is very effective in children still continues despite the improvement provided by CB0. Let me now change tack and talk about the third test which I introduced to you in the algorithm and that is the tuberculin skin test or Montos. Now tuberculin skin test again what strength to use if you will read uh, the western textbook, most textbooks say 5 to you, but what is important to remember is they say 5 to you of PPDS. PPDS is not something which is available in our country, what is available to us is PPDRT23. An equivalent dose of PPD R223 to a 5 TU of PPDS is 2 TU. So, therefore, what you need is 2 tuberculin unit of PPD RT23 for giving this test. That is something very important to remember because 5 TU PPD RT23 is much higher dose, right. So, having known that, you give it, I, I will just show you the method of giving PPD. Remember, what you read it is you read the induration and a positive test which is considered positive when it is more than 10 millimeter just indicates TB infection. It does not indicate a presence of TB disease. This is how you give a TT, uh, PPD test or tuberculin skin test also called as a Montus test. You would need to give it intradermal making an angle of about 50 percent in the skin and you are able to raise a wheel of about 6 millimeter. Okay? Once you have raised that wheel, you, you take out this, this 26 gauge needle and this child comes back to you after 48 to 72 hours and you read the induration and not the arrhythma. That means you read the hardness of skin which can be sometimes as raised and as dramatic as this, but in malnourished children can be better felt than seen. So, induration is what you measure in children after giving tuberculin and a positive test is 10 millimeter. You could have several situations where you could have a false negative tuberculin skin test even in an infected child. One of the commonest reason being incorrect administration or could be an improper storage of tuberculin or it could be because of any immune deficiency which could be either HIV or a primary immune deficiency or use of immunosuppressive drugs. Or, or severe malnutrition. Severe disease, bacterial, viral or mycobacterial can also give rise to false negative tuberculin skin disease, this uh, tuberculin skin test. You could have a false positive test, one because of incorrect in interpretation if we read erythema which may sometimes be more than the induration or because of the infection by the non-tuberculous mycobacteria. This is how what we, what are the tests which are used for pulmonary TB. Now quickly let me take you through with the other tests which are specific or specific investigations for diagnosis of extra pulmonary TB. So for extra pulmonary TB like peripheral lymphadenopathy, tubercular lymphadenopathy, what you need is a fine needle aspiration cytology which is seen by a pathologist or you could do a lymph node biopsy if your cytopathology does not give you the answer. However, a very important test which can be done on this aspirate is either a smear or CB0 and as I all as I said in the past also CB0 gives you much better sensitivity. So remember if you aspirate pus or cell sap from a lymph node, this is a very good material 
which can be used for a microbiological diagnosis also. So, if you are in a smaller place where a, a trained histopathologist may not be available, a cytopathologist may not be available, you can still do aspiration and send that for a microbiological diagnosis which gives a fairly good yield for peripheral lymphadenopathy. Miliary TB again we because it rest of the things it, it are just like pulmonary TB, but because it is miliary it spread disseminated all over body you may like to do a CSF to pick up an early meningitis. Pleural effusion is something else which, which, which comes in, t, in t, as a manifestation of TB in children. This is where you would need to do a pleural tap to differentiate from other causes of pleural effusion in children which can be bacterial not always mycobacterial. And what helps you here is the biochemical test that it is an exudate which is more than 3 gram protein and it has usually lymphocytic cells and it is usually not pus. Cultures may help. However, CB0 is something which has very poor yield for pleural TB. For abdominal TB, abdominal ultrasound, a cytic tap may be useful when there is a cystase. For osteoarticular, again appropriate biological specimen like joint tap or synovial biopsy may be used. For pericardial, again you could do, you do a pericardial tap and you pick them up by, by radio imaging. So, for Algorithm when it comes to extra pulmonary TB, it is about collecting an appropriate specimen from the site which may not always be available, but if it is available you subject that to microbiology through CB0 or liquid culture depending on these what is available to you one any one of these two. It would either detect an MTB or not. If it detects it gives you a confirmed diagnosis which will be in a relatively small proportion. A larger proportion 50 to 60 percent or sometimes even higher would be where you would not be able to detect MTB. In those situations, it does not rule out TB. If you still have a high clinical suspicion, you do other diagnostic tools. As I said, I, I, I referred to some of them in the previous style, the slide and, and then make a clinically diagnosed EPTB. And remember imaging like neuroimaging for TBM, uh, looking at the biochemistry and cytology for effusions may be supportive or the other uh, uh, diagnostics tools which may help you to make a diagnosis of EPTB or they may confirm an alternative diagnosis. The index TB guidelines from our country, they, they, I have, uh, rec they have made very strong recommendations about usage of these tests based on the currently available evidence. For lymph node TB, they, they strongly recommend using expert TB as an additional test in addition to FNSE or if FNSE is not available, this can be used as a sole test. For meningeal, again expert TB can be an adjunctive test. However, here CSF and neuroimaging play a very important role because it is a very serious illness, you need an early diagnosis and CB0 may not come positive in about 60 percent of case situation. Therefore, you would use this as an adjunctive test and not the sole test, but it is an important test to do anyway because you will get a confirmation in about 45, 40, 50 percent cases. Plural TB is where expert TB does not help you, CB0 does not help you. That is where you would need uh, alternative diagnosis uh, methods. One of the methods recommended is ADA or adenosine DMNAs levels. However, these are not a good distinctor for pediatric cases. They may be good distinctor in adults where your differential is a malignancy, but in children usually the differential diagnosis for a pleural effusion is other infections which are not very clearly delineated by ADA and therefore it is not recommended for pediatric pleural TB. So far we talked about drug sensitive TB, but we need to quickly also remember about when to suspect drug resistant TB where you would need a bigger effort to get a microbiological diagnosis. The drug resistance TB should be suspected when the contact there is a known contact with a presumptive or a known or confirmed case of drug resistant TB by with in this patient or if this child is not responding to the first line therapy, if there is a failure to therapy or this child shows an initial improvement, but then starts deteriorating clinically as well as radiological, he becomes a suspect a DRTB suspect. So, remember somebody who has been exposed to a case with MDRTB or likely MDRTB a patient who does not respond to first line therapy or a patient who shows initial or a partial response and then, then deteriorates are the situations where you should keep a possibility of DRTB as a strong alternative. And this is where you would 
uh, start looking for a microbiological verification or pres presence of, of drug resistance. The other comorbidity which should be identified and talked of is the HIV TB in children. HIV test is indicated and that is the national policy in all children with suspected and confirmed TB. Okay. Children living with HIV have a higher risk of having TB infection and have higher risk of progressing from infection to TB disease and therefore have a higher TB related morbidity and morbidity uh, and mortality and therefore one must look at TB as a comorbidity in children who have HIV disease. Approach to uh, diagnosis of TB remains quite similar to the what, what I showed uh, to you earlier. So, what are the key messages at the end of my talk? I would say diagnosis of TB in children is challenging because microbiological diagnosis is not possible in all. Wherever it is possible, the access to specimen is difficult while you need a early diagnosis because there can be serious involvement like CNS involvement or meningitis. We should always make an effort for microbiological confirmation even in pediatric TB though yield is lesser than adults. Expert MTB or gene expert or CB naught has significantly improved the prospect of TB diagnosis in children and therefore, this should be used as early as possible depending on the facilities available to you. But this should be gui gui guided to you by presence of a lesion. So, when you have a presumptive case who has an X-ray suggestive, highly suggestive or an X-ray which was not highly suggestive but has no response to antibiotic, in all these situation when you collect a respiratory specimen, you should use CV0 as an important test for di making diagnosis in children. However, remember CV0 will not always be possible and you would have to make a diagnose in the absence of bacteriological confirmation using other techniques like X-ray, ultrasound, CT and an MRI which may be useful depending on the type of involvement. Thank you so much for your kind attention. I hope you, you I was able to describe the diagnosis of childhood TB to you well. Thank you.